Hi. Welcome to Wellness Woodbridge. I'm your host, Kim Cole. Joining me today are two very special guests to talk about a very important topic, which is diabetes management and awareness. Kimberly Conberry is a research coordinator for the Institute of Health of Rutgers University, and Dr. Leventhal is a physician in the Department of Medicine at Robert Wood Johnson and also in the Institute of Health at Rutgers University. Thank you so much for both coming on the show. Diabetes, a very, very big topic. First, let's just talk about what exactly is a diagnosis of diabetes for someone. Well, I think, too, part, part of it is that you know, we appreciate being here because it's such a, sure. it's really hit global proportions. And, um, and when you look at American, uh, when you look even in our own homeland here, we are looking at 25 million people mm -hmm. that have been diagnosed with diabetes. Seven million of them have not been diagnosed yet, have it, but don't really, don't know that they have it. And then you have those that are young. We're looking yeah, at we're the greatest. Seeing, we're seeing a change in, in diabetes occurrence. Mm -hmm. It used to be something that was a disease of adults, 45, mm -hmm. 50, six, older people. And now it's become an epidemic of young people. So a lot more people 20s and younger and right? adolescents. adolescents have diabetes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's a worldwide problem. Mm -hmm. Every place in the world is beginning to see an increase in mm -hmm. diabetes. And it's not just, I mean, we oftentimes we, you may associate diabetes with someone that is o overweight or has um, made poor choices in, in what they've uh, you know, chose to eat or they're not as active. Um, clearly, it is connected with uh, a familial history. But there, the big misnomer is that it is just in that category, and it is not. There are many, many people that have diabetes that are not overweight, that are, that are very, very thin. And for them, it is a connection of having a family history of it. There's a genetic predisposition. And if all of the um, elements come together with their choice of food and their lifestyle, to catapult them into having a diagnosis, having it become full-blown, it's occurring. And it's really important for people to understand what some of the risk factors are across the board and sure. not to think that because I'm, I'm not overweight that this can happen to me. So what are the major risk factors that doctors look for also that people should be aware of? Uh, the major risk factors are um, kind of a constellation okay. of things mm -hmm. that, that you expect to see that put someone at risk. Uh, one is increasing weight, especially in the middle of the body, okay. so you sort of look like a pear. Okay. Uh, the second is uh, family history of mm -hmm. diabetes, because if someone has members of the family who are diabetic, they're more likely to be vulnerable doesn't necessarily mean they will get it, but more likely mm -hmm. to be vul vulnerable. Being overweight, so the distribution of fat and being clearly overweight, uh, we look at chemistries in the body where the mm -hmm. cholesterol levels are very high, blood pressure may start to be elevated, and when you, when you check a blood test on someone who hasn't eaten for 12 hours and the blood sugar is higher than it should be. That's how you make these diagnoses. And now, the diabetes that you're talking about, the 25 million, 7 million mm -hmm. unknown, but oh, they're walking at around at least 30 to we're 40 million. What they're calling type 2 mm -hmm. diabetes. Exactly. It used to be called adult onset. Mm -hmm. Clearly, right. not the not case anymore. anymore. No. Um, it's called type 2 diabetes. So, what is that? What is what does the body do? What how it's happening? in the body? Well, when, when you eat, um, that food then <laughs> gets broken down. We have an illustration that we brought um, that might be a little bit easier to you know, take a look at. But when you eat, um, the food is then broken down and it's converted into glucose. And that glucose is very important because what happens is it goes into the bloodstream and it is there to help nourish and provide energy mm -hmm. to all of our tissues organs. The problem for people that have type 2 diabetes, there's two things. As the glucose goes into the bloodstream, 
it then is supposed to, at the time that the glucose goes in, your pancreas is alerted. And the pancreas then excretes out insulin to go into the bloodstream and connect onto that glucose to, to bring it into the cells. When that happens, then it, it goes either into your body, it's either stored, or through exercise, you can burn it off. But if there's a problem with the insulin, if your body is not able to produce it, can't produce enough, or the body doesn't recognize it, then that glucose remains in the blood and when you take your um, when you take your monitor and you self-test, you're going to see the residue. You're going to see that amount that's left in in the blood at that time, and that gives you an indicator as to how much and how your body is processing food and glucose right. mm -hmm. as it moves along. And so, d diabetes is a result of just overtaxing that system over that, time. That's part of it. Uh, the body has to have energy. Mm -hmm. Everything needs energy to move and work. And the energy source for every part of the body is sugar. It's glucose. And everything we eat at some time or other gets, gets broken down uh, with a variety of mm -hmm. chemical reactions to form a sugar molecule. And the body takes that little sugar molecule and burns it and creates energy. Every part of the body. Uh, and it's handled by a whole series of we're complicated, complicated mm -hmm. interactions. The main thing that handles sugar uh, or glucose in the body that allows it to be absorbed from the stomach and from the, bat, from the gut and carries it to cells is insulin. Insulin is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. It's made in the pancreas. Mm -hmm. But the pancreas has a finite amount cells to make pancreas, and if you put in too much glucose or too much in the way of, of nutrition, it overtaxes it and eventually it, it mm -hmm. wears it out. It's interesting that you say too much nutrition because it's not just mm -hmm. cupcakes and cookies, no, it's everything. nutrition, it's yes. calories. calories. Mm -hmm. So eating a thousand calories of sugar-free jelly beans is still over nutrition, right. mm -hmm. too yeah, and, much nutrition. And you're not... And, Certain things don't provide what you need to build your body, to make sure. muscle. If you don't have proteins, you can't make muscles. Mm -hmm. You have to have a little bit of fat. You have to have cholesterol, because cholesterol forms the boundary of every cell in the body. If you don't have it, you don't give the body what it needs to build, sure. and it just mm -hmm. stores fat. And it stores fat in the liver, it stores fat in what we call adipose tissue, which is the fat layers mm -hmm. every place. Sure. It enters every major organ, and then it starts depositing in blood vessels because it has no place else to go. So it, which leads to it, other diseases that's right. as well. Right. So that's what hardening of the arteries. That's what atherosclerotic mm. vascular disease is. Mm. So now diabetes management. Let's talk mm -hmm. about so someone, and I eventually want to get into pre-diabetes, but let's first talk about diabetes management or mismanagement and what that means for people. Well, don't you think before we do that, we have to say something else? <laughs> like the fact that diabetes is silent, silent. which is oh. why it's not diagnosed. You don't mm -hmm. know you have diabetes. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's very interesting. And so what are... Until something has gone so far along and changed so much, mm -hmm. then you know you have diabetes. That's when we diagnose it. So Except how do we, we can... change that? How do we change that? Ah. How do we change that? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> well... Part of it is recognizing what the risks are, mm -hmm. which we'll talk right. about, and uh, being alert to what the risks are, and also being vigilant, monitoring and checking to see if you start seeing the signs of the changes in the body. That's what we do. Mm. Uh, it's silent. I can have someone come and tell me my di diabetes is mm -hmm. messing up my liver, sure. but I can... But the damage is just... That's right. Constant. Constant. Well. But the good, the good news is that it's slow. It's a slow, progressive mm -hmm. disease. So if caught early and exactly. managed correctly. So you're really looking at, you know, hoping that people go to their doctors on a regular basis and get those blood tests so that their doctor can then consult with them as to whether or not he or she sees that there's a progression in the glucose in their blood. Um, regular checkups even uh, with your ophthalmologist or optician because mm. really, Sometimes it's caught at that doctor's office when they, he, get, he or she gets a very good look 
into the back of the eye and is able to look at the vessels to see if there's any hmm. changes in there. But I think what becomes very, very important is that with the, some of the studies that we've been doing, we've heard so many people say that at the very time that they were diagnosed with diabetes, they were overwhelmed. They felt trapped. They mm. were angry and upset. They either took out all uh, foods that they believed were um, high in sugar, deprived themselves. But really, it's important to understand that it is little changes that you can do. Mm over a course of time. Again, this is a disease, this is a chronic disease that takes a while before the damages you know, can actually and occur. And about the management of it, it's not just taking your shot of insulin or whatever no, 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 no. and, you and don't then want eating cupcakes. That. You still don't it's use come, yeah, it's, it's a many things. approach. That's right. Nothing is simple one on one. Mm -hmm. You haven't got a magic <laughs> pill that's going to take it away. Right, right. Because you have to look at the mm -hmm. big picture. And management has to be a team approach. Mm -hmm. It's not just you, it's also the family. Mm -hmm. It's the environment you live in. It's what you have access to in terms of food, but activity, because if you smoke, mm -hmm. that adds insult to injury. Mm -hmm. So it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. And alcohol, alcohol damages the liver, pretty, actually takes up and destroys the, the tissues that should be storing the extra nutri nutrition mm. that we need. So the really the management of it, there's a scientific thing to it, but there's also very much a social Absolutely. health yes. behavior yes. side to it. And I know you guys are doing some research at the Institute mm -hmm. of Health. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about some of that research just in that like health behavior mm -hmm. side of mm -hmm. diabetes yes. management. Sure. Um, we, there's two. There's two studies that we're doing. One is actually looking at those that have great control over uh, their glucose levels. They have been in um, very good maintenance. And the reason why we look at that is because they can tell us exactly how, when they first learned that they were diagnosed, what it was like for them. Mm -hmm. And some of the trouble spots that they had encountered and some of the strategies that they've used. We know, we are here, we hear it, we're bombarded by all the messages of lifestyle eat well, add exercise. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to hear it, but it's another thing to really embody it and do the change that needs to occur. So in looking at those that um, have expert control, we're learning from them about some of the pitfalls that they had, some of the struggles and the strategies that work for them. We then take that understanding and we also are with, um, we're you know, focusing on trying to enhance and increase self-maintenance practices with those that are have been that are diabetic but don't have the greatest control sure and through that it really is again taking a look at um, what what are you doing presently you know how is it that you are eating um, what are you choosing to eat and not only just that but it's also looking about activity how is it that you can increase your activity mm. and I think that a, a good portion of the time, it's not just in the education. Education is very important, but it's in really helping them to problem solve. I was just going to say, in what they solving can do. the problem exactly. for them. Concrete solutions. Mm -hmm. We're running out of a little bit of time here, but okay. I do want to touch on um, pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's that's the buzzword out mm -hmm. there. I know you don't, not a fan <laughs> of the word. Well, I think the well, word doesn't really let people understand what it is, and it mm -hmm. carries stigma to it. Mm -hmm. Sure. But the bottom line is it really represents those people who are very vulnerable for overtaxing their bodies so that they really cannot deal mm -hmm. with the nutrition that they eat, uh, that uh, they're going to overtax the insulin produced by their pancreas. Cells become resistant if there's too much fat and too mm. much noise going on in the system. They can't even process so and sort of use. like the system has f flags up, like, you got hey, it. Absolutely. too much here. And, and we know that if you take care of yourself and really mm -hmm. want to keep from getting ill and getting this chronic problem, you can reverse it, but it takes work, just like mm -hmm. it took work to get there in mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. place. It took a long time to That's get That's right. There. And it takes a while to reverse it mm -hmm. also. But we know that you can do it. People can and do and you can see that the diabetes will not happen or may get mm -hmm. prolonged by 15, 20 years. Among that. all the other mm -hmm. health benefits of mm -hmm. 
controlling nutrition, exercising more, all those other diseases also. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And the risk for heart disease because yes. that's hands in glove yep. with diabetes. In fact, that's the major, one of the major killers is heart disease. You can change the course of heart disease mm -hmm. and high blood pressure, but you have to be willing to put the effort in. It's, yeah, it's and it's very depressing the way mm -hmm. uh, Kim described it. When you give someone a label of a chronic lifelong mm -hmm. disease, mm -hmm. that's very painful. How can my body abandon me like mm -hmm. this? What's going on that this should happen to me? And it's terrifying mm -hmm. because, sure. I, you know. But, you, but the, the thing that I think um, many of them need to understand is there is hope. Yeah, sure. that I think that you find those that are, are struggling so much because they are cutting out everything. And that's not, that's necessary. Just closing the door. Exactly. Sure. Everything in moderation. If you want the cupcake, maybe have a quarter of the cupcake, <laughs> <laughs> right? A you taste. love jelly beans, not the bag, maybe six. There are things that you can do that you're not de necessarily depriving, but you're really looking and making the better choice. Mm whether it's in portion control, the amount of food, it's your fist. It's not the, you know, filling your entire the plate. The platter, sure. Exactly. So it's, it's your portion control, it's your substitution, it's in moderation. We don't live in a bubble. So when I say that, I think about those that sometimes struggle with their glucose going skyrocketing and they don't necessarily understand why. And oftentimes you may be doing all the right things, but perhaps stress. Stress, ha you know, you have a little stress in your life, and well, your your sugar can go up, or you're not feeling well. So you have again, a virus. that multifaceted approach to managing whether right. it's the right. pre-diabetes and trying to get that under control mm -hmm. before it becomes diabetes, right. or if you have diabetes. We are out of time. I apologize. Okay. We could probably talk forever on this because this is a big topic, and I That's know true. Um, we see a lot of it at, at the YMCA mm -hmm. and in our population that we have there. Where can people get more information on anything? Well, we Contact us at the institute. Mm -hmm. Great. And we, have, I, we have a number that will we'll give um, you. That It'll we can put it up on yeah. the screen. It'll be up on the screen. All right. For um, Absolutely. A number, and then um, you can have my email if you're interested in participating any um, in any of the research or getting more information. We'd be happy. Excellent. To give that. Really important topic. Again, that mm -hmm. silent disease. Mm -hmm. We don't know silent. it's happening until. And it hits every along. part mm -hmm. of the body. Yeah. And people don't appreciate how it hits every part of the body. In different ways. But you can do something. something. If you act exactly. and you start, you can do something to lessen the consequences. To If you have um, complications, neuropathy, um, problems with your vision, the things that you do, those changes that you make, can slow it, stop it for a period of time. So there's hope. This is not a jail sentence, death sentence. Sure. Well, thank you both You're so welcome. much for coming on the show. Hopefully we've helped a few people out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll get some people for your research, but also just help people. Again, maybe that 7 million think, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I should go get, so go see my doctor. So That's right. thank you so much for being You're on the welcome. show. And we'll be right back. Hello and welcome back. My next guest is Melissa Scholes, a registered nurse at the Center for Women at Raritan Bay Medical Center. Melissa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Center for Women, awesome name. Um, talk a little bit about what it is. Uh, well, basically we provide uh, mammography services, breast biopsy services, breast ultrasound, breast MRI, um, surgical referrals, resources, and support for women who are going through any kind of breast health issue. Um, we also do risk assessment. We do um, bone densities for osteoporosis mm -hmm. screening as well. Um, and within the hospital, we have a lot of different services for women that can be reached through the Center for Women. Uh, okay. We have an incontinence program. We have an integrative medicine department that you know does sure. things like Reiki and guided imagery and things like that. So my role as the nurse navigator mm -hmm. is basically to 
customize a care plan for the patient, whatever their needs are, whether they're going for their first screening mammogram and they have questions, if they get called back for additional views and they want to know why, or if they are told that they need to have a biopsy, I guide them through that process. So what, let's talk about mammograms. I mean, there's tons of information out there. I know a while ago there was a controversy about 40. No, don't get them till 50. Talk about the different types of mammograms. So, Okay, so generally um, you should have, for the typical population, average risk population, you should have a baseline at 35. I think that's so important. It, you mentioned it when we were talking before the show. Age 35 is the baseline. I don't think that information's out there. I don't yeah. think people realize 35, that seems young, like you're not right. in the realm of mammograms Well, yet. the goal is that when you go to have your mammogram at 40, they'll have something to compare your films to. Mm. Every breast is like a fingerprint, you know, no two are alike. And when you look at the film, when the radiologist is evaluating your image, he's going to look to see if anything has changed. So this way, if you go at 35 and you come back at 40 and then go annually, they'll have something to compare to. Um, but if you wait, let's say, till you're 50, they're going to see something and think, hmm. Right. We might Chances need to are, test that. Uh, even, even if you do have your first uh, screening uh, at any age, um, a lot of times you will get called back for additional views because, you know, they want to make sure that they're getting a complete study, um, different areas of the breast. Uh, if you look at the film, there's like black and white cloudiness in there. The black usually represents fat and the white represents fibrocystic tissue. So what we want to see is, has anything about the pattern of your breast changed uh, on the image? And sometimes it's just a matter of compression. Um, I know that's a big concern for some people mm. and that people have heard, you know, that it's, uh, you know, a very painful, painful procedure. Sure. It's, it's not so much painful as it is temporary discomfort. Um, and the goal of the compression is to make sure that we can see through everything. If there's an area of fibrous tissue, maybe on the top part of your breast and also another one on the bottom, and we compress and take a picture this way, if it's superimposed, it may look like there's a nodule there. And the same thing may happen when we do the other view. So what so they'll do... So it gets do, squeezed both ways. I'm, yes. I'm for to be totally honest, mammogram, I've never had a mammogram, yes. so I'm just asking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for screening, there's four views. Um, it's a CC, which is top to bottom, and then a left to right. Mm -hmm. uh, for both sides, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then the radiologist will look at that, see if there's any changes, or if there's an area that he can't see through, like that fibrous tissue that I was talking about. Sometimes they'll call then you back. They're going to call you back. So right. how likely is it that just even if your normal risk factor that you're going to get called back? Because that's terrifying for people, I think. Um, I'm not sure about the callback rate, but uh, for the amount of people that get called back, mm. nine times out of ten, it's fine. It, but it's just, that's good to know because really right. when you get that call back, you think, oh my God, they they've found seen something. something. It's not so much that they've seen something so much as we need to make sure there's nothing hiding behind this or that. Mm. Um, and, you know, they'll really focus on those areas that they can't see through. And sometimes just that little bit of compression spreads the tissue so we know there's nothing hiding under there. Mm. Um, the and other that's when they come back for that diagnostic mammogram. So the right. additional views are what they call the diagnostic. Right. An additional view is a diagnostic mammogram. Or if a patient feels a lump or the doctor feels a lump or there's a change in the skin um, or the texture or the shape of the breast, then they would come in as a diagnostic right off the bat. And what that is, is basically you're going to get your full work up that day. Um, you'll speak to the radiologist and or myself, um, and you'll get your answer as to whether, you know, yes, there's something there that we have to maybe biopsy or do an MRI or do an ultrasound. Um, or, you know what, everything's fine. It pressed out. It was normal breast tissue. It's our job to prove that. Okay. That's so if there's any question about, you know, when they're doing a comparison, you know, changes are expected, but if we can't tell with 100% certainty that it's a normal change, a biopsy is recommended. Mm. So it's recommended more frequently than people realize, and 80% of our biopsies have to be benign at the end of the year. And that shows the American College of Radiology that we've biopsied everything based on statistics, based on numbers, based on how it looks, you know, we're biopsying the right thing. So you're appropriately, what that's saying is you are appropriately scanning the results you're getting. Correct. And so talk a little bit about who looks at the scans. There's a computer system. Oh, yes. Okay. So um, what we do at Raritan Bay is uh, we have a double read program. 
So what that means is every screening mammogram is read by two radiologists and uh, what they call CAD. It's a computer-aided detection system. Mm. Basically, it's like spell check for mammograms. Hmm. So um, it's getting three reads, really. And then if the two radiologists have a conflict on what the recommendation should be, they'll bring in a third opinion. Mm. So it's the radiologist that recommends the biopsy. Yes. You, the results don't have to go back to your doctor. They do, actually. They do have to go back what to the doctor. What happens is um, the primary doctor or the OBGYN will write the prescription for whatever type of mammo is appropriate for that patient. Um, and then the radiologist reads the films and he issues a report to that doctor, almost like a consultation, saying this is what we see, this is what we recommend. Now, one of two things will happen at this point. Either that doctor will write a prescription for the patient to have uh, a biopsy right away, mm -hmm. or sometimes they prefer that the patient see a surgeon first. Hmm. And there's good and bad to both things. Uh, one is everybody wants to get done right away. Everybody wants yeah. to answer immediately. But sometimes going to a surgeon first has an advantage where, God forbid, there was something wrong. You have someone set up to take you the next step. Hmm. If for some reason we're unable to do uh, what we call a core biopsy um, because of the position of the area or because of the patient's condition, Again, they're set up with someone to do a more invasive biopsy, which is hmm. called an excisional biopsy. Again, this just must scare people, though, without having the basic knowledge of talking to someone like you, right. a nurse navigator. And knowing all Whoa. the positive information. Yeah. There's a lot of fear out there. Absolutely. Um, and I feel like, you know, a lot of the, the media focuses on the fear. Um, but knowledge is power. power. Absolutely. And, you know, it's empowering to know, you know, it's just like any other screening test. You're going to go for blood work. You're going to go for colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to go. You go for and mammo. get your teeth cleaned. Exactly. Go for your mammogram. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, is it uncomfortable? It, it can be. Um, there's some tricks that we can do. Some manipulation. Mm. Sometimes what we'll do is if someone's had a bad experience, um, I compare them with a different technologist. Mm. And sometimes it's just a matter of their technique, almost like matching a hairdresser with a client. Okay. Um, and then there's also some people that, you know, they're really tender. Usually we recommend, you know, for screenings, you come the week after your period so you're less tender. Mm. Um, but some people can take Tylenol an hour before they have it done. Um, but most times that's not even necessary. So the pain, real quick, we'll wrap up here. Um, the pain, you, you said something about shoes. If you're, yes. if you're willing to wear uncomfortable shoes to a yes. wedding. Yeah, if you're willing to wear uncomfortable shoes to a wedding because they look nice, you can take a few moments of discomfort to you know, protect yourself against breast cancer. Well, Melissa, I hope we've opened some people's eyes and made people feel a little bit more comfortable about the Center for Women and what can they expect here. I think if people just talk to you on the phone or in person, I think maybe more women would get their um, annual mammogram. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, no problem. Hopefully people will call you with more questions. Yes, or... please, they can call me directly. Um, the number is 732-324-5135. Perfect. Um, or they can email me also. It's M as in Melissa, Scholes, S-C-H-O-L-Z, at rbmc.org. Excellent. Melissa, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having awesome me. Awesome topic. And we'll see you next time.